a newborn baby girl emerges fresh from her mother's womb. Suddenly, her eyes are dazzled by something that you and I call light, or perhaps a source of light, a light bulb. Prior to emerging from the womb, she's never had this experience before. Her sense of lightness didn't really exist. She hears sounds. She's never heard sounds before, at least not to the extent and the sharpness that she's now hearing them. She feels things which she has never felt before. She's being handled, whereas before she's just floated, as it were. All these things are additions to what had originally been, more or less, a blank slate. She had no experience of any of this, and now she suddenly has all these experiences coming at her, at once. And in a very rapid uh, period, very rapid uh, succession, all of these things are coming at her, or even simultaneously, and they change her forever. She has been affected by these experiences profoundly and altered, but she is still herself. She is still that um, infant that was in the womb five minutes ago, but everything has completely altered. She's had experiences that have changed her forever. Those experiences that have now clung to her consciousness are karma. Any experience that you ever have in any way, shape, or form, even a non-experience, i.e. a dream or um, an idea that you read in a book, has its effect on you. It clings to your soul. It clings to who you are. And it affects you. That's karma. In the West, I think that karma is terribly misunderstood. Um, we, A lot of people in the West believe that it's some sort of metaphysical version of the golden rule. If you do good to other people, good things will happen to you. It's far more complex and far more enormous, immense a concept than that. Karma is essentially everything other than human consciousness. I'll um, turn over to Swami Vivekananda, who's got the classic definition of karma. And I'll leave it for him to, uh, to, to describe it far better than I can. Like fire in a piece of flint, knowledge exists in the mind. Suggestion is the friction which brings it out. So with all our feelings and actions, our tears and our smiles, our joys and our griefs, our weeping and our laughter, our curses and our blessings, our praises and our blames, Every one of these we may find, if we calmly study our own selves, to have been brought out from within ourselves by so many blows, so many experiences. That result, or the result of that, is what we are. All these blows taken together are called karma, work, action. Every mental and physical blow that is given to the soul, by which, as it were, fire is struck from it, and by which its own power and knowledge are discovered is karma. This word being used in its is, is being used in its widest sense. Thus, we are all doing karma all the time. I am talking to you. That is karma. You are listening. That is karma. We breathe. That is karma. We walk. Karma. Everything we do, physical or mental, is karma. And it leaves its marks on us. Now, the reason why I harp on this karma issue is I would like to see, um, again, an atheist deal with this. I would like to see an atheist deal with this central tenet of all the Indic religions. The Buddhists, the Jains, the Hindus, and all the various subsects. I'm sure there are exceptions out there, but Generally speaking, they all rely on some theory of karma. 
Some of them go to extreme, i.e. the Jains, who say that karma is the physical universe. It's actually real. It's actually material. Um, but they all do agree that it's something that is other than consciousness itself. It's separate. But it somehow clings to us. Or somehow we cling to it. And there is a relationship between consciousness and karma. And exploring that relationship is one of the central themes or tenets or goals of Hinduism or any of the uh, Indic uh, faiths. Let's see you debunk that one, Mr. Dawkins. Thank you.